Welcome to the 20th episode of the Nerdum and Other Nonsense podcast, your home for all things nerdum, gaming, tech, and entertainment. You can easily find our podcast on YouTube, iTunes, and Google Play Music. Also, be sure to follow us on Twitter to get the latest updates and info at Nerdum and Other. Today, we'll be talking about the games we played this week and some current news, but our main topic of discussion is going to be the top five games from our past that we regret buying. I'm Bcom, and with me today, I have... Leo. And... Savage! Well, that, sound, that doesn't sound exactly like Savage. I think he's out sick today, but he did want to deliver one message. And that message is, I write love letters to Razor! Okay, actually, maybe that was Savage. Thanks for uh, recording that for us, Savage, before the podcast. Yeah, yeah, very well, since he has, like, laryngitis or something. Yeah, I mean, it really... It made his voice sound a little different, but not... I mean, it's not way off. That's definitely... Eh, it's par for the course. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but anyways, you guys laughed at me when I said I was doing day drinking for Memorial Day with my friends. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, you have to call it day drinking? I'm like, that's how... She worded it. <laughs> I just went along. So how was it? Uh, it was fun, you know. And it's we're we've all, we all this this group of friends of mine. We've been partying since we were like sixteen together. Mm -hmm. Now we're fifteen, fourteen years later. So now our parties consist of also little kids running around, <laughs> and it was quite funny because. We can all hold our own. It's no big deal. But we were just drinking lightly. Any, regardless, we all had to go to work the next day. But it was funny because the host of the party, Erica, was like, uh, you know, it's a success, successful party because we had one little kid puke. <laughs> we had another little kid pass out on the couch. And we had another little kid streaking naked through the yard. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. That's the trifecta. So that's the three signs of a successful party. And I believe we still nailed it, even with children involved. So... <laughs> <laughs> that was my memorial day how was uh your week uh my week was really fun uh i didn't like go out and do much for memorial day weekend but i did stay in and play a lot of video games with a bunch of friends uh which was really fun and i guess that kind of leads into what we've been playing so um i guess i'll get the first one to talk out of the way because it's a little faster i played a bunch okay. of league of legends in a group of five uh, and like only two of the people who were in there would even call themselves kind of like league veterans. Uh, and so they were kind of guiding us through and the other three of us were basically noobs. And I guess I, I'd played a little bit more cause I'd played with Savage and his guys. But, uh, this group was like the group I went to Japan with. And so we were playing like a normal match. Oh, really? Yeah. And <laughs> it was a disaster. <laughs> we just, <laughs> we just like had no communication. We had no idea what we were doing. Very few of us know like how to control more than like one or two heroes. So, oh, I'm surprised that the uh, two veterans didn't like instruct you guys. Oh, and, they like, did. Well, they tried. They did their best. Like, I felt bad because oh, like okay. they were like, oh, you need to go here. And we're like, wait, what? How, how do I do that? <laughs> It's like, well, oh wait, I use the what power? <laughs> I don't like it's I mean League is like a really in-depth game. Like you have to first you have to know how to buy all the stuff like from like you know the Nexus, whatever the heck it's called. And then you have to know how to use all of your individual powers and then how they play with other heroes' powers and how to avoid mm -hmm. those powers. And there's like a hundred billion heroes, so it's impossible to know all those unless you just play it constantly. Um so what we did was we played bot matches uh and we actually got a lot better just by playing some like high level bot matches like it was actually really funny the first bot match we placed played we almost lost and i'd never lost <laughs> against bots before because i always played with like savage these guys against bots and i never realized uh -huh. that like bots can be hard if you have no idea what you're doing um but that then sounds like a good way to get better though. oh yeah it was way better like by the like third match or so we played we were just killing them we were destroying and i was playing lux and i was playing her mid lane which i hadn't done before because i guess after recent patches lux has become like even better at mid lane than before and like so like by the last match i was getting like 17 kills and stuff it was really fun but uh yeah league of legends surprisingly fun when you actually play it with a group of people <laughs> <laughs> when you solo queue it's not nearly as fun oh it's, yeah it's probably pretty terrible uh and then okay the other thing that i dived into this week because of my friends which i bought a while back 
and played for like a month and then just had lost all interests uh was final fantasy 14 um the mmo so i hate mmos and i'll probably talk about that in our final section of this podcast <laughs> they, they almost never capture my interest uh, except this time around i had a group of friends who are really into it and like could guide me along the way and then like help me level up and stuff so i have a lot of thoughts about final fantasy 14 like it is an mmo ass mmo in the <laughs> in the way that you will spend like two hours in a row just doing straight fetch quests like to get to like to unlock the next dungeon and then after that dungeon's complete you will do two more hours of fetch quests like and it gets really bad at some points it's like hey go talk to this guy he's halfway across the map oh now return to the person who sent you to that guy oh no go back to that guy now you need to talk to him again it's just like you're running back and forth yuck and it's yeah it it's not great my other problem with it is that a lot of the dialogue is just like useless I find myself just skipping through dialogue boxes a lot. Um, some of the only stuff I really pay attention to is if it's like clearly got like something to do with like the main quest line and is actually important. And it's kind of easy to discern that because they make it a little bit clearer. Or if like there's actually spoken dialogue in cutscenes, I'll pay attention to that. But if there's a cutscene that doesn't have spoken dialogue, I'll probably rush through it. Because, huh. yeah, and yeah. I just don't like the. Um, the style of writing it's very like medieval speak uh because it's like a fantasy world of final fantasy set in like a medieval castle era kind of uh so everybody talks like very properly uh and like i don't know just in that old fashioned mm, way yes proper good sir and yeah, i don't think that works for mmos because like you want to kind of like get through the dialogue you don't want to have it have to read like this really proper like these proper sentences that you don't normally have to read uh and so it like takes it bogs you down if you actually have to pay attention and read everything it would be better if it was just like more straightforward dialogue uh with like you know a little bit more uh flavor to it than what this has this is like all really dry uh but i do hear it gets better kind of with the expansions but the thing about final fantasy 14 which is going to be changing soon is that you have to play through all of the content of the original expansion before you can start in on the second expansion's content uh content uh, i'm so like how many hours does that involve then a lot like oh, probably like 100 to 150 hours i'm guessing of just playing through the original a realm reborn game uh, getting to level 50 or 60 I can't remember what I think it's 50 uh, and then you have to play like a hundred quests once you get to level 50 to unlock heaven's word content and that's even if you've just bought heaven's word like if you buy heaven's word it doesn't mean you get to play heaven's word you actually have to beat the original expansion first and then you can play heaven's word uh, but they're changing that there's a new expansion coming in June called Stormblood which is like the whole reason I'm actually playing this now is because I kind of want to uh, be able to play with my friends when that comes out uh there they are giving players an option to spend 25 dollars to just jump into the storm blood, blood expansion without having to play all of the prior content so that kind of sucks on that they're making you pay for it like in addition to buying the expansion too but at least there's an option for people now but yeah it's uh it's very yeah, beautiful. I game. don't know about that. Yeah, I don't know about it either. Like I think this whole game is pretty expensive in a lot of ways. Like it's a it's a subscription fee, fifteen dollars a month. Uh then you gotta buy the main game, you gotta buy the expansion each expansion. It's it's very expensive. It's like an investment. Wow, fifteen dollars a month? What's wow at? I don't it's gotta be similar. Though I mean wow you can earn tokens through playing the game so you can uh pay for your subscription with like in-game farming and stuff um i think a lot of people do that but i don't know like i'm i, I think it's similar it's like either 10 or 15 dollars a month for a while i'm assuming but Jeez. Uh, it's very beautiful it's all based in the final fantasy universe it's got some great music in there uh when you when it does have big moments they're pretty fun uh, and i hear that it only gets better with the heaven's word expansion so i look forward to that I'm playing as a, well, as an arcanist who turned into a scholar at level 30, 
which is a healer class that had that also is capable of doing a lot of damage, which is a lot of fun. Uh, so I, I have a, a lot of fun actually balancing that in dungeons, um, like being the main healer, but also like taking every opportunity I can to help out with damaging all the you know dungeon bosses. It's really fun. It's like a really oh, act, cool. active healer class, which I like. So yeah, I mean uh, this is this is probably the MMO that is like. I don't know, trapped me the most into it, like out of any MMO I've ever played. It's it's pretty good. <laughs> so I would uh I would recommend if you if you have a lot of ran like money laying around and you don't want to burn it on Twitch stocks, you could uh <laughs> which we'll get to later, uh you could invest it in Final Fantasy. Uh what about you, Leo? What have you been playing this week? Um, similar to your League of Legends, I need a good group of people to play with me on uh World of Warships. Oh yeah, which is uh, <laughs> I used I used to play World of Tanks. Yeah, I played a, a little ton. Bit of that. Mm-hmm. I played I played a ton, and like I could solo that one and be halfway decent. But I am not finding this at all in World of Warships. Oh yeah, you really need a team to coordinate. Um, <laughs> I go out there, and there's only four class types, and if you're not coordinating correctly. You get crushed. Are the class like, types I'm, like battleship, cruiser, like destroyer kind of thing, or, or what are they? It's uh, okay. So I'll just list them off real quick. You got your destroyer, which is kind of a little fast guy. Mm-hmm. His big deal, you know, is to kind of get out ahead, um, get some beads on the other guys so that the uh, your big artillery guys, the battleships, yeah. can just rain destruction down on them. Uh, but then next to them are the cruisers which are a little bit bigger, a little bit more powerful, decent speed, a lot more firepower. But kind of their thing is to, when the uh, destroyers run ahead and they see some enemies, they they can drop a smoke screen and disappear. Well, then that's... And destroyers can still do a decent amount of damage. They have uh, torpedoes. Uh, Torpedoes will wreck anything and everything. And, like, they can cruise up next to somebody and just, like, drop some, like, almost point-blank torpedoes and wreck even a, a, no matter what ship it is and just wreck it. But they have to get there in the process. Okay. So if they're not being back, but backed up by anybody, you'll get wrecked. Right. Uh, the cruisers, later on, they also get torpedoes, too. But they still can do some pretty decent damage with their main guns. And you're expected to take damage as a cruiser. But if your battleships are in the back backing you up with artillery fire... You will kill your opponents before they get anywhere near to killing you. And then you have your aircraft carriers, which are... I haven't really gotten into them yet. I'm still in the Ooh, beginning that game. That sounds fun, though. Very, very interesting. They definitely need to hang out way, way in the back. They have no guns of themselves. Mm-hmm. But what they can do is send their ships, that uh, their planes out. And what they do is they can scout and find enemy units... Uh, and then I believe there's two classes. There's like the fighters that can take out other kind of aircraft. And also, I, I, I could be wrong, and also do a, a decent amount of damage to a ship. But then they have their bombers, mm-hmm. which I've been hit by those before. And they do a ton of damage. <laughs> and like basically, yeah, you just you need to line up in that formation and execute that properly. Like if you get thinned out too much and come across like a mass of the other enemy they'll wreck those they'll wreck those let's just say three players and now they have a big advantage on the other team who is too thinned out and they just literally just walk right through you what's your favorite so you need, uh class to play i man i'm really torn between i have not played not even a single game of the uh destroyers <laughs> but i really i am I like playing both roles of battle cruiser and uh, regular cruiser. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Those two. Those are pretty fun, and they're completely different roles. And uh, the but the thing about the cruiser is, if your battleships aren't backing you up, and you're trying to play a little forward like you should be, it's oh god, you get wrecked so quick. <laughs> It's so bad. So, like, you really want, like, a, a good coordinated team would have a blast playing this team. And it has the same feature, like League of Legends. You can play against bots or you can just play against uh, other players. Okay. But that's it. Uh, I'm still playing Fire Emblem Heroes. And today was an interesting day because when I opened it, uh, 
they straight up put waifus in the game. Like, <laughs> like, like they brides, came out with four right? <laughs> brides. Yes, they took four characters in the game, uh, gave them new skins. They're all in bridal uniforms, uh, and gave a new little side main quest, uh, paralogue quest or whatever it's called to play. You know, which is pretty fun. And uh, one of them's actually re- two of them are pretty decent. I think they're all at least like. I, there's one site I follow because I think they're pretty they're pretty on par, but they have a ranking system of, of a S class, A class, B class, C class, D class, and I think one of them's an A class and one of them, maybe two of them's an A class. But anyways, they yeah, they just do decent damage. But it was just funny because I got in and this is a Japanese game, so it's just hilarious to see, you know, they just in, injected waifus into it, and it, I was taken by surprise. But then I'm not too surprised they went this way. So it's pretty funny and it's hilarious because I tweeted about it earlier this morning and then just a little bit ago before we recorded later this evening, I see gaming sites talking about this. So I'm like, I was ahead of the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, follow Leo's Twitter if you want to be ahead of the game on Fire Emblem Heroes News. <laughs> uh, so do you think they're going to add husbandos to the game? Like, are we going to get some of the guy characters in tuxedos? Like... Or do you think um, they're just doing I really this hope so because otherwise it's just kind of like yeah. uh, treating because the game's about collecting heroes and building an army so it's so just by bringing out just the women it should, they brought out four women they and presenting them as collectibles is kind of not good yeah yeah I kind of agree like I hope yeah. they make it a little bit more equal like even if they just I, do like four guys and then they can do like eight more girls whatever just like give a little bit of equality here like well a while back they did do a like a male one and a female one for something different like they did like male mages and like mm-hmm. then female mages or, or something like that so I feel like they will it'll just be a week later okay and if they do that totally cool yeah, that would be totally uh, And cool. then then I won't have anything against them just doing, you know, waifus. So they'll just do the, they'll have the husbandos. So they'll have them both. <laughs> and they stagger them, obviously, because that's how you want to do content when you do a game. So, yeah. All right. Well, that's cool. Uh, yeah. Have you gotten any of those new uh, characters yet out of orbs? Or? Uh, no, I just got back up to 20 orbs. And I oddly got a, a, a female character, but she's only four stars, not five, from a different one that we did. And she's. She's a healer, and she's, like, one of the worst things in the game. So it was totally pointless and mute. No, but I haven't gotten anything yet, and it's really hard. Like, the, I think when they – I like, the way the system works is it uh, – like, five stars are, like, a 2.5% chance when you go to summon them. But uh, when they're specialized like this, they jo- jump up to, like, a four or a five. They actually give this statistic in the game, which is awesome. Um, I'd have to – open it and look but then i'd start playing so i can't shouldn't do that (laughs) so yeah i i I haven't got any but i only rolled once for them and uh the way the summoning system works is like you want to wait till you get to 20 orbs because it costs five orbs to start a summon and then your second summon is another five orbs and if you do this all in one session you're like your third summon drops second summon drops and like then the first summon drops all the way back down to like like three orbs or something so it uses a full 20 orbs Mm -hmm. so it's your best bet your best bang for your buck you get a better bargain by buying a bulk is what the game does exactly yeah so buying five at a time is what you want to do and that requires 20 orbs right otherwise it would cost 25 if you did one at a time which is a nah don't do that (laughs) sounds like a nightmare (laughs) yeah uh so you want to jump into news go for it all right so we have we're two weeks here before E3, so this is the time of year when news is pretty slow, because uh, a lot of things are being saved up for two weeks from now. And uh, I think next week's yep. podcast will be probably a big E3 preview, like what we want to see. But we do have a couple items of news worth talking about uh, this week. Uh, and to lead it off, like to me and Leo. This is probably one of the biggest game announcements in a long time. Yeah, and I didn't even see this until you, yeah. you until you put it on here. This like this wasn't on my radar at all. But uh, now like this made it to Reddit at least. At least Reddit knows. Uh and the like Gamatsu.com had it. But Little Witch Academia, the Witch of Time and the Seven Wonders. 
is coming I to feel PS4. like because Savage isn't here, we're taking advantage of it. But oh, this yeah. was posted. This was posted before we knew he wasn't going to be here, so it's hilarious to me in that <laughs> yeah, it's concept. <laughs> anime gaming co- podcast. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so it's coming to PS4 in Japan later this year. You know, from Bandai Namco. Uh, if there is a god, it will come to the West at some point in the next couple I years. I so hope so because uh, you can uh, you can find the article about this on Gamatsu, and there's there's YouTube videos of the trailer, and it's just Akko and Lote and Susi, and their CGI forms in the game look fantastic. There's also animated cutscenes as well, uh, probably by Trigger. I mean, it looks at least like Trigger, um, but I can't confirm that. So, uh, like. I just so badly want to play this. And I think, Leo, you said, like, it said something like, Explore Luna Nova Academy. Yeah, that was one of the uh, lines when I was reading the article. And that one line sold me. I was like, I will buy this game just to explore Luna Nova. <laughs> <laughs> if it comes to the West, for sure. Yeah. And uh, if you listen to our anime podcast, we don't have to preach you on this game. <laughs> but if you don't, this anime is, like, phenomenal. And it's actually going to come out on netflix Mm -hmm. and it's uh it's only the first 13 episodes june 30th i don't know when the rest of the the series will come out it's like 26 episodes right yeah uh, 25 i think it will be eventually 25 yeah yeah, somewhere around there but and my best way to sell it to a modern audience that especially american westernized whatever and you're not into that foreign stuff or whatever you want to refer to it as if you are a big Harry Potter fan or even remotely enjoyed it, watch it. Mm-hmm. It's like a female version and I I think it's better. <laughs> In a lot of ways it's it's just as good. Um I don't know. I mean mm-hmm. I love Harry Potter. Like but like it's definitely Yeah, I've read the oh, books and I've watched the movies. It captures and I do like um, Harry Potter too. It captures but. like the magic and wonder of like a wizarding world very well. Uh, yes, and the main character and not to mention is really among... cl- uh, clumsy and uh-huh. awkward, but her sidekicks are so good, and the rest of the cast is extremely good. So, yeah, Susie's best girl. We both agree on that. Susie awesome. is absolutely best girl. Oh, man, if I could just like, so it, this looks like it's going to be an RPG because um, I look, I saw a screenshot. You have like Akko, and then you also have like Susie and Lote in your party. Uh, yeah, it's very brief. Yeah, but uh. I was just so excited to have Susie in my party. Like, like, I hope you can switch her out to be the main character because I just want to play <laughs> as her. It'd be so much fun. Yeah. And uh, just one last thing. Uh, in the anime world, this thing is a big deal and amazing. Like, that's how big it is. It's yeah. one of the best of the best right now. Once it hits Netflix, I think it will get much, much bigger, too. Um, but, yeah. but it won't. It will only be the first half of the season hitting Netflix, and I honestly think. I mean, we're pretty far into the second half. I think the second mm-hmm. half of the show is even better. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. If you if you even remotely enjoy this first season, if you do go and watch it, mm-hmm. we'll just let you know the second season is so stupidly amazing. Yeah. Good. Oh my god. It's so good. Every episode, you and me have to like sit down and be like, how how does this keep getting better? <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, uh, the first uh, half of the season, there's a lot of, like, episodic episodes that are just, like, kind of one-offs, and it's slowly building a story in the background, but halfway through, it really starts, like, okay, this is the main plot, like, this is what we're heading towards, and, like, this is what we have to do to get there, and uh, you can follow it through to the end, and it's really fantastic. And the girls are super cute and fun. And not yep, yep. and not overly sexualized at all, as they would be in other anime or anime games. It's very like family friendly. This show, in most ways, at least. Oh yeah, de- oh yeah, definitely. You can uh, you can have your four year old, four or five year old sit down and watch this with you, and they would, they might like it more than you do. I don't know. Pro- <laughs> probably. All right, we need to get out of this. This is not the anime <laughs> podcast. So, uh, <laughs> next item on the docket, as of May 30th, which was yesterday, uh, as we're recording this, if you purchase an HTC Vive headset, it will now come bundled with Star Trek Bridge Simulator. Uh, and this is a game that just released. It's also on PlayStation VR. And there's also cross-play between Vive and PlayStation VR. So if your friend has a... PSVR and you have a Vive, you can play with them, and that's really cool. 
Uh, I watched a uh, like hours worth of a stream last night where it me JP on Twitch was playing this with three other people and it looked so much fun. Like, so you basically are, you can play as a f several roles. You can play as the captain. You can be the helmsman who drives the ship. You can be like, um, an engineer who is sort of controlling like, uh, how much power goes to engines or shields or weapons at any given time or you can be like the weapons specialist uh who fires like photon torpedoes and phasers at ships but you have to all communicate <laughs> to each other and it's so good and they uh the stream i was watching and i'm sure many other streams after this once they figure out how to get all this uh connected and actually streaming they were role playing it so hard. It was so much fun to watch them be like, oh, oh yes, Captain. <laughs> Captain, the Klingon bird of prey is off the port bow. It's like so good. Man, um, I'm not a Star Trek fan, but this really makes me want to get one and yeah. try it out with you. It reminds me of like some ride I was on, maybe at like Disney World, like a million years ago, where you were all like parts of a crew that was piloting a ship. Actually, this might have been when I went to see, like, the Nautilus or something. I don't know. There's something where, like, like everybody in the room had to work together. And, like, you had a captain and you had other people in charge of different systems. Except now it's all in VR and it's all cloaked in Star Trek. And you can literally look around and see the people around you. They even have the newer ships. And then you can actually unlock, like, the old... Uh, original Star Trek bridge and ship and there's different controls for that ship because uh, like literally you just had to like press like weird looking buttons on <laughs> in the show for that and like you know the newer shows have like more detailed like controls and stuff that make a lot more sense but I like that they have both of them in there uh, it looks like a dream come true for Star Trek fans and a lot of the reviews I'm seeing are saying that, like, hey, if you have friends to play this with, like, this is the, like, VR experience that everybody hoped it would be. Uh, and this is, like, the Star Trek bridge experience you've always wanted to have. Uh, so I, I see this game selling a lot of PSVRs and probably some Vives, too, now that it's bundled with Vive. Uh, and I would highly recommend playing it. I'm definitely going to be looking out to hopefully play it in the next couple weeks. Yeah, I would like to get a uh, PSVR just to be a little bit different in case something doesn't come out also with the vibe for you. Yeah. So we at least have somebody review it. But then it has the bundle, so I'm like, huh. <laughs> well, yeah, but the vibe is so expensive, and then you need, like, a beastly PC to run it. So, I mean, I, I probably would just recommend PSVR. Yeah, Um, my PC will... Will run it, would, yeah. Yeah, it would run Vive, but also you can... The PlayStation VR, I believe you can also put that on your PC. I think you can, yeah. There's definitely ways to use it on PC. So you can yeah. do both And ways. you can, and I, when I was researching it, you can actually also put it on the Xbox. But the thing is, it's not a VR headset really at that point. It's just another screen. It doesn't move when you move. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. But anyways, on to the next one. For the... Absolute longest time. I think we'll die before this game comes out. <laughs> uh, Square Enix fully takes over development of Final Fantasy VII Remake from outsourcing developer CyberConnect2. Um, so they have had been outsourcing it the whole time, and now they've taken it in. I don't know if they were... They didn't really give reasoning why they did it. Just maybe they were taking too, wrong, too long. Or, I mean, it's, it's obviously something they can keep in reserves until they feel like they need a big boost of money because this is going to be I will buy it. Well, yeah, I, I think care. everybody will buy it. Yeah. Unless the reviews are horrible. I mean, we'll see. I mean, there uh, even, even with horrible reviews, I totally see this game still selling. Like, I mean, what all they're doing is updating the graphics, right? And are they doing much else? Yeah, I mean, they're they're supposedly story? like changing the battle system around to a more active battle system and they're, I mean, they we don't have a lot of information about exactly what they're doing. Turn based, or um, that's a good question. I don't know, it may just be active or a mix of both. Because I swear to god, if they go to hack and slash, <sighs> yeah, I think that's kind of what they're aiming at doing, which I think is a terrible no! idea. I think it's a terrible idea, but uh, oh my 
But I mean, like, the other... Th- the other- <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, why remake Final Fantasy, Fantasy VII and not make it the game that people actually want? <laughs> like, why would you do it why and make the it something features? that people... Why change the gameplay features? I could, I could understand yeah. tweaking them, but not completely changing them. Yeah, so, I mean, it, there's a, probably still years before we're going to see even the first part of this game, since it's supposedly coming out in three parts. Uh, but now that they've... So they they were outsourcing at least part of the game to CyberConnect 2. Maybe not all of it. But now all of development is going to continue in-house at Square Enix. I think this is honestly maybe a good thing. Um, yeah, bring it in-house. Hopefully it does make it faster. But I feel like I'm going to be 98 with my cyborg arms. And I'm going to be like, yay, I can play Final Fantasy VII on my X station. <laughs> <sighs> and it's so like yeah the square square enix's uh representative naoki hamaguchi said about this that like so far development has been carried out mainly with the support of external partners but however in view of factors such as improving quality when the product goes into the mass production in the future the company has decided to shift the developmental system back to within the company so as to maintain a stable schedule and have control over factors such as quality we will be forming a robust system within the company to properly carry out the development. So basically, they just said the word quality twice, and that's kind of shitting on CyberConnect 2. <laughs> so I like guess. They, they couldn't make a game that was as high quality as we needed it to, to be. So at least Square Enix realized this and decided, like, no, this is not going to be up to the quality that you know fans are going to be expecting for this game to be i felt like it should have been in-house in the first place if not a joint partnership exactly yeah i mean i think at at least part of the development was probably in-house but i don't know how much of it they were panning off on cyber connect 2 who by the way are best known for making really below average naruto games so (laughs) i don't know why they thought that was like a good idea um, to to outsource this Final Fantasy VII remake, one of the most anticipated video games of all time, to this it company. Makes, it makes you wonder if Square, Square Enix was like, "Hey, so give us an update. What you got?" And they showed it to him, and they were like, "Oh God." Well, you see, Cloud Naruto <laughs> runs from place to place, and uh, oh, this oh, no, oh, it's so bad. <laughs> so they were like, oh, "Okay, uh, this is not going to work." And also, when I'm 98, I'll be glad to explain to my grand cats <laughs> that they don't make games like they used to. Did you say your grand cats? Yeah. <laughs> Chio's, Chio's grandchildren. <laughs> ah, the cats are fixed. They'll be totally different. Oh, okay. but... <laughs> uh, yeah, I look forward to playing this game in three years. <laughs> yeah, uh, quick short story. Chio, I got her as a kitten. She was, whatever reason, the parents wanted to get rid of her a little bit earlier than you should have from a parent cat so when she first came over here she just sat in the middle of the living room going meow, meow, meow. and then she kind of got over that okay and then she went in the heat one time <laughs> oh my god this tiny little cat the size of like a workout shaker bottle <laughs> had to have been an opera singer in her previous life <laughs> it's just this big <laughs> like at like two in the morning oh, and you can't man. get them to stop it's horrible but anyways go on <laughs> cats man cats uh love them and hate them so moving on to an rpg that will actually probably come out at some point is uh square enix also has announced uh lost sphere is the new name of the rpg coming from tokyo rpg factory uh it'll be coming in early 2018 to nintendo switch ps4 and steam and this is the follow-up to the game I Am Setsuna, which was a nice little RPG that was uh, made a lot of homage to Chrono Trigger. Uh, and I played when it came out. Uh, and it was a really, really fun game. Um, it's basically... The Setsuna was like a slimmed-down RPG uh, with like a, a cute, like, not exactly anime, but cute, like, chibi art style. Um and like some beautiful areas but like not like too graphically intensive or anything um but that allowed them to just like write a decent story with some pretty fun characters um and have like a slimmed down easy to play through rpg that didn't have like systems built upon systems that you had to pay attention to and all sorts of crazy stuff tacked onto it just like a fun little rpg campaign 
Um, and I think that's exactly what they're going to go for with Lost Sphere. Um, the uh, only thing I would ask out of this is that they spend just a little bit more time on the characterization. Even though I liked the characters in Setsuna, I could have used a little bit more uh, like closure and like good dialogue and storylines from them. I mean, that might be asking for too much, but like I just want like well-written characters and a well-written story. Uh, and I do think from the trailer, from the tone of the trailer, it's going to be another sort of like emotional uh, journey. Just kind of like how Setsuna was, and I look forward to that. I was, I think I when I when I bought Setsuna, I played it something like three days and just finished it because it was it's like not exactly bite size. It's like a mid length RPG, like 15, 20 hours or something like that. Um, actually, I think it be I think it might have been more. It might have been like thirty hours. So maybe I played it in like yeah, I played it like three or four days, and just it's a fun thing to like spend time on in between some other massive games. So yeah, you have that to look forward to. Uh, I wish Savage was here because this next item I almost exclusively put on news for him. Though, I, wait, does Savage even own a PlayStation? Uh, original PlayStation he made. <laughs> like, didn't he convert one over or something like that? I think so. I th I don't know if he has. Yeah, a he PS4, made a though. something work on like an old laptop, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that's. True. But I do have a have a, uh, a PS4. opinion about this. If you want to start it off so yeah ps plus free games for june 2017 will be life is strange and killing floor 2 and then there's some other games for ps3 and vita that i don't really care about but life is strange baby is now free with playstation plus uh so if you had any excuse not to play it before you should go do that it's really good what about what did you have to say about that leo uh, I thought you were talking about the other one. Oh, Killing Floor 2? <laughs> no, where you were asking about his thoughts. I thought you skipped an article. Uh, I didn't. <laughs> no, I thought you were skipping an article. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. I was asking, I, don't, no, no. I was saying this about that because, like, Savage had said he wanted to play La La Life is Strange. The uh, last okay. podcast. I remember uh, Killing Floor, like, 2 or 1 being a thing on PC first, right? Uh, yeah, definitely. It's been on PC for a while. Hmm. That's pretty interesting. We'll move on to the next one. All right, yeah, you can take this article. It's your baby. Oh, man. So a programmer put $50,000 on the stock market. Not a big deal. Whatever. But then he did a Twitch thing with it and let it decide like the, they did with the uh, Pokemon. God. So Twitch... So... 50,000 of his own hard-earned cash, he just let Twitch randomly decide by just doing either a buy or sell option. Um, guess what? It ended badly. <laughs> he, uh, They ended up going with uh, Advanced Micro Devices, AMD, and it started out the day at like $11.46, but was down... 25 cents by the end of the day so it only left him with twenty two thousand dollars so he lost out wow and and like there was actually like a big community behind it there was like people actually trying to be cool about it and he said i just the reasoning is his reasoning behind the whole thing was you know i just want to see what would happen that's that's it would i be trolled or would people be you know cool about it but this is quote from the article he says I wanted something with real real world effects, real world consequences <laughs> for what you type into that chat, Robert said. He's an Amazon engineer, by the way. And he said this surprisingly upbeat. And when asked what he was planning on doing with the money prior to Stockstream, he said, nothing, really. Yeah, if you wanted some real world consequences <laughs> from your fucking money, you could have like given it to charity. You could have done any number of other things that would be useful for this money and but instead you decided to just like throw it in like a fireplace and let twitch chaos take care of it like yeah i thought this article was absurd i if he if he was actually trying to figure out i don't know something that would lead to something that would be productive for society or like you know like why does something work something way he, just anything would have been made this so much better than just to be like I wanted to see what happened. Yeah, if his angle was like, okay, I want to see do like a cool social experiment where like we crowdsource like my financial broker, like 
first of all, it would have had to have like a lot more planning than this and a lot more options and like a lot more safeguards, obviously, than just mm-hmm. like Twitch plays stock market where it's like anarchy versus, you know, whatever. Oh, God, it's just so stupid. Twenty five thousand dollars of his money he loses because of this. He doesn't lose more than twenty five thousand because you're only allowed to uh lose twenty five thousand dollars in a single day by like financial regulations yeah. otherwise he would have lost more he would have lost like twenty eight thousand mm-hmm. dollars so i mean good for him for wasting what some people can only make in a year good for you i he sounds like he's just happy to get the attention really yeah i mean i just hate everything about this like you can spend your money how you want, but don't like flaunt it in public and then just throw it away uh, for no reason. Just absolutely no reason. It's just so stupid. Not to mention, he could have, the way he did it, he could have done something that would have been like, I don't know, had a professor or two who's like interested in like the social things and like actually did like a type of a study on it. Mm-hmm. I mean, he could have done that, but he didn't do any of that. So, yeah, it's just a weird, weird and infuriating story to me. (laughs) Yeah, just such an absurd article that like when I read that, I'm like, I have to include this because this is outrageous because I know people listening to us are going to be like, what? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Okay, and then there was one last small piece of news, which is we almost could just skip. I only brought this up because Savage is very interested in graphics design or graphic design. And Ubisoft came out with a small blog post this morning saying that they're changing their Swirl logo for the first time since 2003. It's It's been that blue, uh, swirly Ubisoft logo for a very long time. Which I feel is still up to date. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Um, but they've basically made it a more minimalistic, just black and white version of that Swirly logo. It looks lazy as fuck. It does look kind of lazy. I kind of agree. I mean, it's clean and I, crisp, but nothing else. I just want to... I like minimalist, but if I can create your logo, <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. I can re, I can create this. It's not good. <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, I will say I think I, I like the font choice a little bit better, like slightly. <laughs> That's about it. Um, Yeah. I'll agree with the font choice uh other than going from a neat graphic designed logo with cool color schemes and going black and white yeah. with something i could probably draw with a stencil <laughs> is not that's not cool no it's really not uh, but yeah. their older stuff's neat uh it, you can totally tell what period it's from without the dates underneath them oh yeah god like the they on the article website they have like 1995 logo it's like ubisoft with just two separate words and then like a, a rainbow over it it made me think of mtv so bad <laughs> oh yeah the 1986 <laughs> one looks just like mtv too like yep. oh my god <laughs> ubi and then like written diagonally and cursive is soft and it's like huge pink block letters for the ubi oh my god looks so good <laughs> yeah, but the 1995 one looks like Microsoft to me. It really the does. The rainbow effect. Yeah, that's yeah. just... It just shows par for that era of time. For sure. So, anyway, let's move on. Uh, we have a quick movie and television news section. Uh, Leo, was there something that you watched this past week? Um, I haven't watched it yet. I'm looking forward to watching it. Oh, okay. Uh, it's for... F is for Family, season two. It just came out literally yesterday of this recording. <laughs> uh I just, my roommate moved out and a new one moved in. So I had to get my own Netflix and F is for family popped up on my Netflix and I watched the first season and I really loved it. It's by a comedian by named Bill Burr. I usually don't care for his stand up. I love his stand up. He, <laughs> he has funny things, but like a lot of the time, like he's so opinionated about stuff that like, I don't find it funny. Mm-hmm. But anyways, moving on. I think the show's hilarious. I think it, the little daughter in the show is like the best part of the fucking show. <laughs> she is hilarious. She like defends her older brother is like bigger, meaner, and tougher and stronger. But she's just this tiny little thing. It's great. God, I should really I'm watch just, this. I forgot that he had made this show. Completely forgot. Yeah. 
I, I'm just really looking forward to. I'm probably going to start watching it after we get done recording. And I'm also ready to <laughs> do another rewatch of Archer from the <laughs> beginning again because I'm almost at the end of season uh, six. Yeah. And this will be my pro. I think my sixth time rewatching the show. <laughs> I, for whatever reason, I can just keep rewatching Archer, and I love it more and more and every time. And Carol, Carol is probably my favorite character. Carol, <laughs> Carol, really? Oh my god! Yeah, because she's just bat <laughs> si- bat shit crazy. I do love her. Um, what's um? Who's your favorite? Do you watch? Did you watch? Oh yeah, I watched Archer. Archer. My favorite is the uh, robot. A holographic anime girl and <laughs> the doctor or whatever there's a weird scientist Krieger? who created her yeah Krieger oh Krieger and his uh <laughs> his van yeah with the yeah the anime robot I, every yeah, scene pretty... with them like makes me laugh so hard it's so good um no yeah Krieger <laughs> is hilarious and like they do the Japanese stuff because he modeled it clear it's an anime character. There's yeah. no way around it. Yeah, <laughs> it's straight up anime character. It's so good. Uh, and it's it it is very very good. But oh, uh, and and I will say, Kyle at work. I think his par- favorite character is Pam. Oh, well, Pam is fantastic too. She has no uh, filter I'll, at all. I'll, I'll be honest. All these characters are pretty fantastic. Yeah. But you just got to pick one as your favorite. <laughs> I also like Woodhouse sometimes. From time to time, he has a really good line. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll make your omelet. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> so speaking of shows that uh, showed up on Netflix, uh, I dove into the first couple episodes of season five of House of Cards. Uh, and so the whole story around House of Cards leading up to this season is that reality has been stranger than fiction recently in politics. So like, how can they possibly do anything to top what is actually going on in U.S. politics in 2017? And the answer is they really can't. Uh, I watched, like, the first two episodes. Well, actually, when I clicked on it on Netflix, for some reason it hadn't saved my progress or whatever. And it sent me all the way back to season one, episode one. So I started watching thinking that, like, they were doing some weird flashback thing at the, the beginning of season five. And I'm watching, like, Kate Mara, like, walk around and, like, all this stuff. I'm like... Man, this this is really good. I wonder where this is going. And I realized I was watching the first episode of the entire series, and kind of had that in the back of my mind. I was as I was watching the first couple episodes of House of Cards season five, and realizing that like, man, I really crave for what the show used to be, and not exactly what it is anymore. I feel like it has a much more limited scope now, and it's much much more limited focus, and it's just. At least in the first couple episodes, obviously it's a slow burn, but it's not qu- quite as hard hitting or topical as it was previously for me. Um, but I'm interested to see where it goes. Of course, I'm going to finish it. I mean, I I love the writing in the show, just the level of writing and the level of Kevin Spacey and Robin Wright's acting is so high that it'll carry me through the season as it usually does, I'm sure. I was definitely disappointed by season four of House of Cards, though, so... I'm hoping that season five, at least in some ways, has some bombshells to drop that will be equal or as just as interesting as season like three and two and one had. Um, but yeah, it remains to be seen. Um, uh, moving on from that, uh, since Savage is not here this week and it's totally anime video game podcast week. Uh, I'll talk about I'll, yeah. I'll talk about a recent anime I, I watched. Uh, the movie A Silent Voice, which is actually being called The Shape of a Voice now. Um, it, Why the change? I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think of Wait, which one is fits it just due due to translation or just just translation? Suddenly... Yeah. So like it's called like Koe no Katachi, which is like I don't know what that would actually mean. Voice of something. Um, Koei means voice. I'm not sure what Katachi means, but maybe it's maybe it's more closer to shape. So they're calling the movie the know. shape of voice. I'll Google it. You keep. Talking. <laughs> they called the manga a silent voice when they uh, brought it over here. They localized it, so that's a little weird. But anyway, it's based on the manga by Yoshitoki Oima, uh, and it's basically about uh, a deaf girl who is bullied by a young boy in her elementary school class. Um, 
but he goes too far and when he goes too far the rest of the class turns on him and he becomes the victim of bullying and then when they both grow up they both have issues stemming from that and he kind of wants to make it up to her basically for realizing like the error in his ways and that he needs to change who he is so it's uh being animated it was animated by kyoto animation who are like my favorite anime studio if if not in the top like two or three uh, and so it's gorgeous uh it's got a uh, great soundtrack for the most part um and i think it's very faithful to the manga only cutting out certain parts that they had to just for length reasons uh there are some issues because of that like there's some side characters who get more exploration in the manga in certain arcs that really are only just in the movie because they were in the manga and they don't really need to be in the movie anymore they don't really have any purpose in the movie they're just there uh, and if you hadn't read the manga you wouldn't really be sure like entirely why they're there anymore um but my biggest issue by far with this movie is a really nitpicky one uh and it has to do with the song choice for the intro to the movie which is the song my generation by the who uh and it plays oh what yeah uh that's just weird that's all left field <laughs> really weird <laughs> i thought so too like i went into this movie with no expectations and heard this and i was like first of all i was like why are we hearing this really really old song as an intro to this movie and then when I thought about it more, I was like, why are we hearing this specific song with these specific lyrics and this message in the beginning of this movie? So I have a lot that I thought about this. I'll, I'll get through it quickly. Basically, I went and found like the director, her thoughts on why she chose the song. Oh, okay. What did you say about uh, Generation there? My Generation by The Who is the song. Yeah. So like basically this this song plays over the like opening as it's following uh the main character who is a bully and his friends around town basically and it's like the director yamada basically said that like she wanted this to express that he and his friends had an omnipotent feeling or felt invincible uh and like or like in another interview she said a kid who feels invincible but also deals with perhaps unfounded frustration this song appeared in my mind with a bang so, I totally disagree. Like, I just think Yamada just doesn't understand what my generation is about at all. So, I think she could have chosen a better song and a much more modern song to represent this idea, first of all, and gotten a whole lot closer to what Shoya, the main character, actually acts like as a kid. Shoya doesn't have any aspirations for standing up for his whole generation of, of youth. Uh, and not even that, he's just like a dumb, violent bully as a kid. And he's not rebelling against the elderly or any other generation. He's just sort of rebelling against people who are around him to be a dick and be popular because he's a dick. And that doesn't speak uh, to my generation at all. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just say because I looked at the word Kitachi and like it was it's just super comple complex. It's all over the place. Oh, really? But generation does pop up in there. So this is and like sound voice. The name can change from like generation to generation. So it kind of helps make a little bit sense of what that's supposed to mean, I guess. Oh, well, if it actually translated it's to like the voice of my generation, that would be a different thing. Like if they had actually translated it like that, then I would kind of understand this song choice a lot more. Uh, from what I can read from the word Katachi, uh, possibly. Maybe. So it means multi. It's japanese writing it can mean multiple things yeah. but yeah gener when you generation that's why i re-asked i was like wait what did you say about generation because yeah suddenly what i just read made sense otherwise i was like i'm ignoring all of this because this is way too complex <laughs> yeah so i went back and i found like what the who's like pete townsend like said about this song and like what he felt it actually meant so like in an interview in 1967 he said uh about it that was like the only really successful social comment i've ever made and when he was talking about the meaning he explained it as some pilled up mod dancing around trying to explain to you why he's such a groovy guy but he can't because he's so stoned he can hardly talk now, that has nothing to do with this movie and then in 1993 he had a more nuanced explanation about like the song uh the song's line i hope i die before i get old and what that actually meant 
And that line actually came from a time, this is a quote, when he was living in a really wealthy district of London just by accident. I didn't really understand quite where I was living at the time, and I was treated very strangely on the street in an imperious way by a lot of people. And it was that that I didn't like. I didn't like being confronted with money and the class system and power. I didn't like being in a corner shop in Belgravia and some woman in a fur coat pushing me out of the way because she was richer. And I didn't know how to deal with that. I could have, I suppose, insisted on my rights and not written the song, but I was a tucked up little kid and so I wrote the song. And so in either, and this is the end of the quote, in either of these cases, the song is supposed to be about the older generation not getting you as a person. And I don't get any of that from Shoya's character. He's never rebelling against his teachers or the older generation. He's just bullying a poor deaf girl to look cool in front of his classmates. And that doesn't fit with my generation at all. So those the reasons that Yamada gave for using the song were not anything having to do with the title. So she she said that it, she felt Shoya felt invincible and that the people who were in the lyrics of my generation were invincible or gave off the feeling of invincibility. And I just feel like it's a really tired song choice. And I think this happens in anime sometimes when they choose Western songs. They just choose like really popular Western songs that they've heard of, not actually thinking about the meaning of the song at all. It's just lost in translation maybe. Uh, and it just didn't fit with me. And every other part of the soundtrack was great except for this opening song. And yeah, it also could have quite possibly been translated different for them. It's very possible too. Who knows how things yeah. get over to Japan f from the who. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> so anyway, that's my big like nitpicky rant about just the song choice that really took me out of the film and like, like kept me wondering like, why is this even here? I was just like, I felt so uncomfortable when I was hearing that song and watching the movie. Cause I was like, I don't understand this choice at all. It feels like a no, bad choice. No, it makes choice. sense because you were watching you're watching it and then they put this movie in there and you're like, "What? Well, this came out of nowhere. Now your mind's totally thinking about the song and not paying attention to the movie." Yeah. And it yeah, it takes you out of the movie and you you miss things at this point. So, yeah, that's that's kind of interesting, but it might be a translation thing, so we never know. But uh in general, I would say the movie was very good ad adaptation. Uh uh, and yeah, it's it's gorgeous. Like the animation is fantastic. There's some really touching moments. Uh, I think in general, I still prefer the manga slightly, um, but that may just be because I read it first. Who knows? But I, it goes into more depth, especially on certain characters. Um, there's certain irredeemable characters in the anime, like now for existence. Her name is now. Uh, she's a slightly more redeemable character in the manga in the anime she just seems like a batshit crazy person uh she's a little bit of that in the manga too though anyway is that the deaf girl no 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 that's uh the bully's friend from elementary school and she was in the same oh, class okay. uh she's a little nuts um and very much a bitch but yeah all right all right that's the end of that section let's move on to our main topic which is uh, five games we regret buying. It doesn't have to be because they were bad. It could be for any reason, but just the fact that we regretted it. But if you uh, want to go ahead and start off with your number one, be calm. I think I'm going to start off with number five and count down to one. Uh, just the way I've structured okay. a list. So I'll start off because like... Actually, do I have a number five? Yeah, I do. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's it's on the next page. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I put his number five just as a catch-all, like pretty much any MMO subscription I've ever paid or MMO game I've ever bought, whether it be World of Warcraft, Guild Wars, Star Wars Galaxies. Almost every single time I've tried to get into an MMO, like, it's been a waste of time and money. Uh, Which is interesting because you yeah. were promoting Final Fantasy XIV. Exactly. Earlier. That that one actually has hooked me. And I think the reason is because I, I finally have like a, a good group of people to play it with. And also because it's just, it's a newer MMO and it's figured out a lot of things that older MMOs were even worse about and made them somewhat better. I still have problems with it. Like I still think all MMOs suffer from poor quest design and poor quest dialogue 
Like, it's just, there's so many quests that you have to write, it's just impossible to make them all interesting. Um, but, like, I wish they would try harder, <laughs> because, like, going to a place and getting four animal hides and then returning and selling them and then moving on to the next quests and doing the same thing with three different items, it sucks. Yes. Like, there's nothing interesting about that. And so it just presents like an obstacle you have to grind through to get to the next thing. Um, yeah, you have to make your game world interesting enough to be going out and finding those four pelts or whatever. Exactly. And they don't really do that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, do you want to go to your first game? Then we'll go back and oh, forth. I'll go to mine. And unfortunately, this has become the Final Fantasy podcast <laughs> at this point. We kept... It just... It just... Odd occurrences kept bringing up. But... I am super regretting buying Final Fantasy XV for, for the Xbox One. Mm -hmm. The game was such a horrible letdown for me. Uh, why is it a hack and slash? I want my turn-based. <laughs> I really want my turn-based for my RPGs. Yeah. That's all I'm asking for. And then not to mention, oh my god, I hate the camera was out to get me this game. Yeah, you really had to views, wrestle with the camera at times for sure. Oh, um, I would be in a, a a battle finding something, and then like an animal, and then additional truths would drop, and I'm like, cool, no big deal. But then now my camera won't get out of this bush or this shed, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I don't know. I, all I can see is my health dropping at this point. <laughs> I don't know how I can fight back. Two of my characters just died, and then suddenly it turns night on me, and there's a level. 30 beast demon thing against my level five and i i hated that the most like i'd be out doing stuff and then suddenly it would turn night and i would be sol because i i couldn't i couldn't i can't fight these things yeah it oh my it ruined this game so badly for me and i wanted it to be so so good you basically just had to run away from those things early on like that's the only thing you could really do oh there were times i would try to mm -hmm. but then i would run into a demon on the other side of the road yep yep that would happen too <laughs> and, and then i would have to run off the road which is not a good idea either at night and oh it was so bad i hated it yeah it it, it totally ruined the game for me I couldn't enjoy it and like you know like if you sit back and you uh plan these things out it'd be so much better that's not why i really play video games really to to plan stuff i play video games to break away from the real world so then to think and i like, can enjoy it and have fun and i can't even tell you to like go back and like say that like that the end of the game is worth it because the story goes downhill as the game goes on as well oh did you finish yeah it? i finished it like way back when before they patched it or fixed oh, anything and like chapter 13 of that game is infamous for being horrible um and just in a lot of ways the story does not make sense a lot of things were just cut out of the story and they're trying to put them back in for dlc uh to get a finished game Oh, I'm so glad you said that because I don't feel bad for about, about not finishing it now. Yeah, maybe at some point when they've finally put out all the DLC and it's all in the game, it'll be a better story that's worth playing. But I don't really think so. Um, I was I was very disappointed by the lack of party members that you pick up in this game as well. Like you base it's basically just the four guys and very excuse me very occasionally you'll get another person joining your party. Um, but I wanted to pick up like multiple party members like old Final Fantasy games and have this large group of people that I'm going on this journey with and said it was yeah just, like, that you could choose from and be cool stuff and yeah. like I really like turn based yeah and it straight up became like a hack and slash with like their own like version of it yeah I didn't like that at all um, yeah I didn't like the storyline from the, from the beginning I'm just I didn't feel connected to everything and also really weirdly this may be personally to me, but I have gay friends mm -hmm. that I'm totally fine with and like would drink together and like I'll hang out with them. And even with my straight yeah. friends, we'll, we'll throw our arms over their, their shoulders or something or lean on them, you know, and whatnot. And like them, I'm totally comfortable. I felt uncomfortable playing this game because I'm like, this is like some like unsaid 
gay stuff. <laughs> oh, really? That's the why? Yeah, I'm the, it's the total vibe. I'm like, I'm like, are all these guys gay for each other? And they just don't realize they're gay. And like, it was uncomfortable and unsettling for me. Like, I wish they would have at least been like, you know, I'm gay and the <laughs> and I like you. And even if the other guy was like, I'm not gay and I don't like you, I wish they would have done just that. Like, but like, I sat it a little bit. But like, yeah, acknowledge it. I'm I'm sitting here the whole time going. This is really awkward because I don't know if they like each other or not. I would say I, but think, I they're, think they do. I think they're supposed to be more bros than gay, but it's like Dude, at it's certain weird, lines, bros. it's like it's like a Fujoshi show. Like it, at certain lines, it's like very much okay. This was put here to make the girls who are playing this game squeal, uh, <laughs> like kind of thing. like like Memorial Day. I when I met my friends like. My six foot two black friend named DJ, who is ripped <laughs> like a chiseled sculpture, we hugged. Yeah. I was like, dude, what's up, DJ? We gave each other a hug, you know what? Hand clap, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Let's go take a shot or have a drink or something, you know? I did it to everybody. Yeah, I, I hugged like, my best friend. I watch too this all the time. and yeah. I feel awkward. <laughs> that's that's so i feel like this is this is a little bit of a problem but it's a japanese game so that's probably why <laughs> yeah yeah but that was my problem with it that's interesting uh so what's your uh next one next one okay this it was a long one in the making so sid meyer's civilization beyond earth so this was sold as a spiritual successor to an older game sid meyer's alpha centauri which was an incredible turn-based uh, strategy game back in the day. Um, that was a civilization game where you had won the space victory, basically, in your normal civilization game. And then you went off with several other uh, leaders from Earth to colonize Alpha Centauri and a planet in that system. And it had this amazing campaign where like there was a lot of like stuff that would happen along the way uh and like you would discover like the hidden secrets of this planet depending on like which technology tree like you went down and stuff uh and you could design your own like units based on like certain things that you unlocked in the technology tree and you could focus on peace or you could focus on war you can focus on technology and it was just an amazing game for its time. It's still an amazing game. It holds up. I would highly recommend playing Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri. Um, but Beyond Earth was trying to recapture that magic, and it kind of just came up short in almost every sense. Uh, the writing was nowhere near as good the as the original game. Uh, the it just lacks the heart of that yeah. predecessor in almost every way. This. Um, all of the unique leaders are not memorable at all. Whereas, like, the leaders from Alpha Centauri are incredibly memorable. Like, uh, like they were just so unique, and they had such interesting outlooks on how they should colonize this new world that really, like, impacted you as you played through those campaigns. Um, and this one, yeah, it's just, I don't, I don't remember anybody who is in this game at all. Um, yeah, I'd never played any of this game, so that's all you Yeah. Um, I would just say, like, also the way the game ends this time around is, like, you just get, like, a you won message, and then it just, like, kicks you out to, like, the main menu screen with, like, no pomp or circumstance whatsoever. Like, holy shit. <laughs> like, uh, usually when you beat, like, a Civ game, like, you would get, like, a space victory. You would get, like, a cool cinematic of, like, sending your rocket off into space or something. Or if, like, when you end, like, uh, Alpha, uh, Alpha Centauri, like, you get this, like, amazing, like, dialogue, like, read off and, like, a cinematic and stuff. Like, this game just felt like it's like, okay, you won. Have, you know, play again. It's like, what? Like, th this is, like, an accomplishment I made here. Like, we should be celebrating this somehow with some kind of effort. But, uh, man, like, I just really did not like that game. I, I wish it had lived up to Alpha Centauri, but it just really did not. Uh, how about your next game, Leo? Okay, my next game is... I swear to God, I'm not trying to pick on Final Fantasy. <laughs> it's just... It's some of my favorites, but then I maybe it's because I have such high expectations. It hurts me. But my next one is Final Fantasy XI for Xbox 360, which is like a their first MMO. And man, it was just bad. I have no experience with that game whatsoever, so I can't even say Good. Anything. Yeah. I'm glad <laughs> you didn't waste your life away. Um, it, 
I honestly played it such in such a short amount of time that like I don't have too big of an opinion on it, but it was it it was not good. It was a terrible MMO. I think I even was like playing WoW at the time. So like I was making a comparison and I, I just hate it and I felt like like you said earlier, it was like a bunch of fetch quest stuff and it was it was dumb and I I don't know if I didn't really figure it out. I didn't really invest too much time into it, but I just regret buying it because I didn't play it. And that's basically my point. So go on with your next one. Okay. Um so next one on the list is Sim City. Now, this obviously is not the original Sim City game. This is the game that EA put out as a successor and or reboot to the entire Sim City series that was completely broken at launch. And when I say completely broken, <laughs> I mean completely broken. Like people literally could not play this for at least a week after launch at all. Be- That's how do you do that? Because what the way they did it was they required the game to be online at all to all times. So you always had to be in contact with EA servers to play the game. And at launch, EA servers didn't work. <laughs> so <laughs> you could not play the game. Good job, EA. So, but there were so many problems with it even beyond that. Like, so I remember like back when this happened, like at, like a week after the game's launch, like EA announced like, hey, we're going to disable certain features like leaderboards, achievements, and like region filters so our servers will actually work again. And I think even after that, people still had tons of problems connecting to the servers. Wait, those three things sound like they wouldn't help if you disabled them. I know. I don't know why like that made the difference, but that's what they said at the time. Like, I know I've been drinking a little during this podcast, but that doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> And what the fuck? Like, and then the whole thing that it they insisted that the game had to be online and they didn't have any good reason for why it had to be online. And then game journalists began That's well, like Xbox. Oh yeah. One when they came out. Yeah, that's you true. Know? Yeah, that was a fiasco was too. Dumb. Um they insisted that it had to be online uh and then game journalists found that they could play the game for 20 minutes offline. But then, like, every 20 minutes, the EA servers would check to make sure you had internet access. So, it was clear that the entire game could be played offline. Like, but EA was saying that it couldn't be. And everybody's initial thoughts went to, of course, it's because privacy, or piracy. They want to avoid piracy by making the game online only. Uh, Which probably would only encourage people to pirate the game even more, in my experience. I think months later, they finally made SimCity playable offline, which, like, they claimed at one point was impossible, but was clearly possible. Uh, So, like, they lied about that. Um, And then, like, even when you got past the problems with actually being able to play the game, once you were actually playing it, it had so many problems with the AI... Like, they would promise things like, yeah, you could follow, like, this one citizen, and you could follow his entire daily route, like, from home to work, and then, like, maybe to, like, a bar or something, and then, like, back home. And that was all a lie, too. Basically, the way the AI worked was, like, you could follow a guy, but he would not go back to the same house every night. He would just go to the nearest house available. (laughs) So, like... Oh wow! I kind of wish I kind of wish society worked like this. Like, oh, I want to go home. I'll just go to like the nearest house <laughs> that's like not <laughs> occupied right now. Oh, it's like oh, that's got, oh, it's nice that guy's seven. mansion over there. Well, he can go to my like little tiny house, my tiny apartment today. <laughs> oh, that's terrible, dude. Wouldn't that be Jesus that would Christ. be an interesting way for society to function? Honestly, <laughs> very communist. Uh, they've, they've come a long way since then, haven't they? Yeah, I think the game works now, but it still uh, has some of the limitations, of course, of when it launched it has like very small map sizes to build on compared to older sim city games and then the uh, the thing that was really the nail in the coffin is that a game came out called city skylines which was a much better successor to sim city in basically every way and just so they at least learned from their mistakes that's good. well no ea didn't learn from their mistakes like the this other company <laughs> EA never learns. Yeah, no, EA doesn't learn things. Uh, this other company made a better game, and nobody plays SimCity anymore, as far as I can tell. So, yeah, I don't. I mean, I wonder if we'll get another SimCity someday, but it won't be anytime soon. And they have a lot to learn from that one. Hmm. Do you think they'll ever come to console? I don't know. I, I mean, they used I, to be on console. I find it way back in the day. I don't know if SimCity uh-huh. like four was ever on console. If, I, I don't know. It's a good question. 
I find it doubtful. But anyways, my next one is I'm reaching deep in my archives, <laughs> and I remember purchasing Mario Paint for SNES. <laughs> uh, basically, what this devolves down into was I was too young at the time, and it wasn't for me, and I hated it, and it was just a complete waste of my meager allowance for mowing my own mother and father's lawn. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it is cool. I was watching as doing my little bit of research. I was watching some YouTube videos and it actually looks like really interesting game. And I saw some like really interesting, uh, uh, people doing some, uh, sound bits and stuff like that. So like, it looks cool. Like now I want to revisit it, but at the time at my such young age, no, no good, no good. But now like I will kind of want to revisit just to play around a little bit and see if it's pretty fun. But did you ever touch it at all? Mario Paint? No, I have like no recollection of that at all. I think I've probably seen some gameplay of it at some point, but no. Yeah, SNES was like my first obsession into gaming. So I was like, I was trying to consume everything I possibly could from every type of game you could get for the Super Nintendo. So, you know, that one's very different from everything else so of course i had to check it out but yeah okay all right i'll move on to my number two game i regret buying and this is battlefield 4 specifically at launch <laughs> uh, and like i would say like battlefield 4 now today is probably a pretty good game like uh if you had especially if you play it with like a group of buddies uh you could jump in there and have a pretty good time at launch, this was the this was worse than SimCity for me. This was like the worst experience I've ever had with a piece of software on a computer ever. Uh, I was in contact with EA support constantly because the game just would not work. So I'd spent like sixty or maybe even eighty dollars on this game. I think I might have bought and bought the deluxe edition uh, at launch, oh, wow. and I couldn't play it. And so like I would go like it had the like the online server browser which was like, you had to open through like one of your internet browsers to play the game it's a really weird concept again trying to get around piracy which ea should just freaking give up on um and it just wouldn't work it wouldn't connect to a match and other people had tons of problems with this too but i was trying to nail down like my specific problem i had windows 7 at the time and was trying to figure out what the issue was and nobody could figure out. I was talking with EA. I was talking with other people. I tried so many different things, like tra changing re keys in the registry of the computer and like <laughs> uninstalling programs, reinstalling other programs, reinstalling Battlefield multiple times. That's insane, dude. The only way I eventually got this to work was I completely reinstalled Windows on my computer. What? And then it and then it worked finally. So something crazy happened with my Windows installation to where it just would refuse to play Battlefield 4. That's some um, weird, like, offside code that, like, nobody would even know. <laughs> oh, God, it was so weird. Um, and, yeah, I mean, like, so, like, everybody had tons of, like, server issues and lag issues at launch. But um, this is, this is a, one of those games where uh, EA actually responded. I remember they stopped development on several other games to focus on fixing this disaster because it was that bad. And they really did get Battlefield 4 to a very good place afterwards, but it took them a while. It took them like a year's worth of work to get it there. Um, man, that was a horrible launch. One of the oh, worst that's launches. Terrible. If it took you a whole year to get a game decent. Yeah. It's like I mean, it's probably not quite as bad as, like, the Master Chief Collection launch, but... Ooh, uh, that was bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's your next one, Leo? So, man, with a heavy heart, because I do like this series, I'm going to upset some people with this one. And I can't remember if it was N64 or GameCube. I'm pretty sure it was Nintendo 64. That I played it on, and just right out, I'll go sit. I'll go ahead and say that Chibi Rob is going to attack me on Twitter for this one. <laughs> uh, but it's the Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, and what killed me for it is the single feature of a time limit. I hate it. 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 <laughs> uh, sometimes a feature or two will ruin the game for me, and it, I'm just so sad that an entire Zelda game is ruined for. 
just this one feature of a time limit. Um, I want to sit around. I want to enjoy the game. I want to explore. You can't explore with a time limit. That just, it killed it yeah. entirely for me. And I just, I just had to. And, and I never played it. I played like two hours worth. And that was it. Man. Two hours worth of Majora's Mask. And it's one of your most regretful games of all time. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. But that's just, that's just what it did. And, yeah. and I want to, I love the Zelda series. And I wanted to love that game. But like it just hurt it for me so so bad. Okay. Um. Any more thoughts on Majora's Mask? Or you want me to go to my? Uh, just one go ahead game? and go to your next one. I'm sorry to shit on it, but uh, it's just one feature that killed me. Just like how like when the Final Fantasy 15 went to hack and slash, it was. Uh, yeah, I, I I hate games with a time limit too, unless it's like a very short game. If it's a long term game with a time limit, then I'm just no, no thank you. Like I don't have the time or will to replay through one of these games if I mess up that time limit. So uh, that's sad to hear. Yeah, and, and like you said before, like I don't go to games to be like constantly stressed out. <laughs> like yeah. that's not why I play games. It's you want to escape your real world a little bit and have like a a fun mental challenge, but not to go yeah. in and be like, Ooh, I want to look at this. And then the moon comes in and crushes you and you're like game over. And you're like, well, fuck this shit. <laughs> oh man. All right. I will say the number one game I regret buying has not come out yet. And that is called <laughs> what, star what, citizen. What? I no, regret buying regret this game. Buying it if it I hugely regret, regret buying Star Citizen because it may never come out. It's so this is the project of Chris Roberts who uh, created like the Wing Commander series among other things. Uh, and I, like a lot of people, bought into like a pre-order for this, like a crowdfunding pre-order uh, where you could get like a slightly better starting ship. Or uh, as a lot of other people bought into, you could get like a much better starting ship if you paid a lot of money. And that model led to like over $80 million in crowdfunding for this game, which is still not come out. Uh, and this like started crowdfunding several years ago now. <laughs> um, but like the, the reason I bought into this game is that I so badly want to see modern space combat flight sims like the old uh, Star Wars X-Wing TIE Fighter games from Totally Games. And I thought that like, hey, if they see that this project can be successful, then maybe they'll get off their asses and make a goddamn Star Wars space flight sim one of these days. Uh, and of course, now Star Citizen just like is stuck in development limbo. Uh, trying to live up to the expectations of the $80 million people have poured into it in crowdfunding, uh, becoming a much bigger bigger project than it probably ever planned to be originally. Uh, so that's one of the things that, like, if you, if you crowdfund, it can be a blessing and a curse to get more money than you actually need, depending on what you actually want to put out. Uh, I think this game might actually be pretty good when it ever does actually launch. Um, but yeah, God, I'm just so disappointed that I paid money for this at all and got kind of suckered into investing in this thing that, I mean, they're kind of open and honest about like their development schedule now, but for a while there, it was a little bit murky and like, we had no idea when the game was ever going to come out and they just keep putting out different modules, like different pieces of what a final game will be. And I just want to see the goddamn final game. That's really <laughs> all I want to see. Eh, there's um, nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I guess that's true. So, uh, I don't know. That's my number one. Like, I do, I really just regret buying it because I feel like I got suckered on that one. Yeah, I don't blame uh, you for that. But I don't. And because I want to see that whole genre succeed, and I feel like this whole huge thing is holding the genre back. So, yeah. And mine weren't really in any order. It was just whatever. But my last yeah. one is, uh, unfortunately, for honor. I thought this oh, game yeah. was going to be really fun. And, and like it it is and was, but this is the main thing. I don't play it. My friends who got it don't play it. And since I don't play it, 
It was a waste of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's nothing to hold it in place as a really good game like League of Legends. Like people are addicted to that; they play it a bunch. Um, I play War of Warships, and I find it way more fun to play than For Honor. Yeah, and like, don't get me wrong, For Honor is not bad, but it can't. It's not competing with what is out there right now. And I think it, that's his biggest thing. I know I had it launch a big thing about like microtransactions, but I don't think that was really a big deal in my opinion. But it just can't compete with everything else that's like a big multiplayer game right now. There's like, there's no reason why I would go. I would still go play Destiny right now just to mm-hmm. keep familiar with it. So when Destiny 2 comes out, I'm like super on top of it because I'm invested. But I just, I do not get invested at all in For Honor. And you bought it too, right? I ended up not buying it because I very closely watched streams of people who I trust playing it. And then very closely read reviews. And I also followed like what you said about it. And it just, I felt like I would buy it after it uh, had um, a discount or something or a sale. Um, Because... I, I'm still interested in it, but I wanted slightly more content and slightly more to do. I also played the beta. That's how I played it, the like yeah, the open beta of the game. Yeah. And like like you said, like it was fun short term and it was very fun to play with other people. But then there was I felt there was nothing long term to keep me playing that game. Uh, and there was just way too many other games at the beginning of this year that mm-hmm. required my long term attention. Yeah, this year is so. ridiculous. Yeah, I was talking with Chibi Rob today and he mentioned like, oh yeah, I need to play Neo. And I was like, oh my God, I I forgot about (laughs) Neo. Like I started playing that game and then Horizon came out and then like I completely forgot Neo existed. Uh, Same. And I need to go back and play it. I just got the PS4 Pro this year and I have uh, Horizon and Neo and that's it. (laughs) And I forgot about Neo because I started playing (laughs) Horizon. (laughs) Uh, I mean, yeah, some games will just make you do that. Like, Horizon will make you forget. Zelda will make you forget other games. Persona 5 will make you forget other games. I and mean, it's crazy because I think I'm amazing. only in, like, the 10, 10, 15% of Horizon, if even that, of that game. It's just, I just feel like the first, the first half of this year, and maybe we'll talk about this in the podcast near the end of June, like a half-year, half-year, halfway podcast or something. Like, the games that have come out in the beginning of this year could have filled three years worth of highlights for me uh um, yeah, yeah i can agree with that like horizon zero dawn could easily filled half a year at minimum yeah easily yeah it's that good of a game and then persona 5 for me and then near automata as well from everything i've heard of it yeah and, and i've been playing I've played. Uh, yeah pers- persona 5 also I'm, I'm, I'm still at the first palace but like i'm like oh my god there's so much of this game left and I love it already, so oh, oh my god, well, where do I find time to play this game? <laughs> yeah, that's that's the hard thing. And it's funny, that's like, my answer to that question seems to be like, never find time and just move on to another game and move on to another experience and then eventually come back later. Like, I, I try to pour as much time as I can into finishing a game, but then sometimes I just like, hey, I want to play Final Fantasy fourteen this week. Like, I want to play Destiny this week. I want to play... <sighs> hey, I want to go back and play Civilization Six this week. Uh, and that's when, when I won't finish uh, games. But I love... That's like that's my life as a gamer. I love rotating in and out of experiences and getting the best of things. I don't always have to finish something off uh, to experience what I want to of it. And I, I think that's like a good philosophy. I don't think people should worry about finishing every game. Uh, and agonize about their backlog on Steam or yeah. on Xbox. So. I mean, I've pre-ordered Mass Effect Andromeda, and I have not even played it yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, that game, like again, is a game where maybe the longer you wait to play it, the better it will actually get. I, and I'm, 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 I've seen lots of stuff I've seen about it. I don't. It makes me not like it much, but I know I will like it, and I will like it when I go and eventually play it. But mm-hmm. oh, there's so many other things I have to play. I need to finish Persona 5. I would love to go back and do event. Uh, I mean, Horizon Zero Dawn. Mm-hmm. I'm fortunate enough that I have been away from it long enough that like it's not tugging at me. But the second I play a 
60 seconds of it, I will be totally re-addicted to it. So like, Oh yeah. So like I'm avoiding it at this point. Exactly. Like when I, I'm going to go to back to horizon probably in the next couple weeks. Uh, and I want to finish it out at that point because, yeah, I just want to go straight through it. Yeah, um, just my big question is, do I want to do Persona 5 or Horizon Zero Dawn first? And I don't know. It's really hard. There are a lot of good stopping points in Persona 5, though. I feel like Persona 5 is the kind of game that's made to just come back to. Um, because, like, there's so many points where you can stop, like, after, like, a big dungeon and say, like, okay... It's not going to be hard to pick up the mechanics of Persona 5 again. It's like, no, it's very easy. So, uh, and even with Horizon, it's not that hard to pick up the mechanics again. So, um, I'll be, I'll be coming back to that first. And I think after E3, going back and finishing up Persona 5 before the fall games start to hit. So, yeah, E3 in two weeks is going to be insane, probably. I'm so excited for that. I would like to note that uh, Destiny Bungie said that uh, they're not going to be having a big reveal. It's just going to be small stuff. So, like, their gameplay reveal a couple of weeks ago was their big thing. So, that's it. Yeah. I'll, I'll expect to see them at the PlayStation press conference for sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, trailer there. Um, and then we'll see what other little factoids we get about Destiny. Uh, but, yeah, I think next week's podcast we'll probably talk about what we'll want to see at E3 and uh, what we can expect to see there. Hmm. And yeah. start getting hype. Uh, so is that it for this week? Uh, that's all I got. So please subscribe on YouTube and uh, follow us on Twitter to keep up with everything that we put out. Um, our handle on Twitter is at Nerdum and Other. Uh, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, or other uh, podcast services. And we'd appreciate it if you left us a five-star review if you've liked what you've heard.